So hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming. So today we have Dr. Diana Mazgutova. Uh, Diana is first of all the graduate of Uzbek State World Languages University, and then she did her MA in TESOL and PhD um, at the Lancaster University in the UK. And currently she is the lecturer in um, education um, yeah. at the University of Leeds, the UK. And uh, today we'll talk about research in uh, TESOL. Over to you, Diana. Okay, hello everyone. It's great to see everyone here and so many familiar faces. And thank you for joining this webinar. Just want to tell you at the very beginning that this is my first experience of uh, using Zoom and of doing webinars. Um, I have been doing some online teaching, especially uh, recently. We had some lectures and some seminars with our MA and undergraduate students um, at Leeds University because of the current um, dif rather difficult situation. But uh, normally I'm used to just teaching in the classroom, so we'll see how it goes today. Anyway, so um, let us start. So today I wanted to talk about research in TESOL and to start with the research in general, to give an introduction to research. And uh, um, the main themes or questions which I wanted to address um, in today's talk are what research is in general, just to discuss some definitions and some characteristics of research in relation to language education. Um, also wanted to talk about some key concepts, I think, or key um, terms which I think are very important to define, like research approach, uh, research paradigm, and um, also to talk about research methods, and just to discuss the difference between uh, these. Um, the other thing which I wanted to uh, mention today, after we uh, go through this, is uh, the research process and some key stages in planning and in preparing research. And uh, I think it would be useful if we had it more as a discussion at some point, because I'm prepared some tasks for you and some short readings, reading extracts to do and some discussion questions, which uh, I would like to, I would like just to listen to some of your opinions and experiences. I'm sure that some of you have been involved in research in the past and uh, you would like to, um, to share some of, your, some of your knowledge, existing knowledge and experience with others. Um, these are the plans for today. We might be also talking a bit about research questions and some key characteristics of good research questions and um, sampling, like choosing participants for your study. And, um, but we'll see how it goes. Maybe we will leave it for um, a different webinar. Um, I asked you to, those of you who have seen the announcement before um, about the webinar, I asked you to read a short article. I'm saying short because it's rather short for, um, for a journal, academic journal paper by Simon Borg. Simon Borg, by the way, is one of the former lecturers at the University of Leeds from the School of Education. And he published many papers in teacher education. Um, and uh, I hope that many of you have read this uh, paper. So if you did, it will be really useful for our today's discussion. So let's start with the, uh, with the first task. At the beginning, before I start talking, I wanted to give um, little, to start with a little activity. I'm just trying to share the slides. I don't know how we do that. Let's see. Do you see the green button it says share screen? Share screen, yes. Yes, click on that. And do I need to open the screen first in front of me, I would imagine, right? Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one you do first. Yes, then mm -hmm. just screen, share, and then open your presentation. Okay, let me just um, try this. Share screen. Yep, okay, I can see quite a few things here, but... No, sh yeah, choose any or ch just screen and then click on share at the bottom. Okay on the right hand. Screen and share. So I should choose the one which I need, right, first. Yeah. No, it's not this one. Um, you can do it again. So go again, share screen. So let me just open again. I lost the, the connection, not the connection, the thing I can't see. Yeah, so just hover, hover over the screen, it will yeah, appear. Okay. Mm -hmm. Trying to, to do that. 
Sorry, everyone, about that. That's just first experience with this. So new share, does it say? New share, yes. can I? Okay. Yes, go for it. Thank you. To choose it, which one? Just uh, um, choose the screen where it says screen and share, and then okay. whatever whatever on your screen we'll see. Choose the screen. Screen and then share. Show video. So something is, no, I, I can't. Sorry about that. I just tried to open it again, very wide. Yeah. Somebody's uh, asking to be admi admitted to. Yes, I'm, I'm doing that. Don't worry about the participants. Yes. So you can do. Okay, the screen. I can't, can't see the screen here. So share screen. It's yes. That one because. Uh huh. Start share screen. Once more. Uh, oh, yes, share screen. Yes. Okay, click. Mm hmm. And then and I click on my slide, yes, the current which I have. You can click on your slide or you can click on just where it says screen. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, just share. If it doesn't work, I'll just explain it orally anyway, it doesn't matter, but um, yeah, I'm trying to open Click it. on share. Something happening, no? Uh, Yes, we can see a desktop. Okay. Yes, now we can see the PowerPoint. Can you see the can yes. you see the slide where it says task one? Um yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah, so if everyone can see that's that's great. We can continue then. Okay. So um in the first task, I would like to ask you to think about about uh, some questions and uh, maybe if you could write your the answers to, I'll just say which question in particular I'm interested in. There are a few questions to think about here. What research is in your understanding? And what I'd like to ask you to do is to write maybe one or two key characteristics of your of research, what you understand as, uh, as research. So don't ignore the last three questions on the slide at the moment, just the first two questions. What is research? How would you describe it? You can use the ideas uh, from Simon Borg's paper, which you've read, or just from your own experience, from your own knowledge. It's just, uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. So you can write in the chat box, right? But if you really, if you really want to speak, you can raise your hands and then I'll allow you to unmute. Okay, hold on. So we have people. Who is it? Okay. Uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm Okay, Diana, can you see the chat box? Um, let me just see. I think all the participants have, a, um, have appeared, kind of all the names. What do I do then to hide uh, them all so I can see? Um, click on the chat. Okay, so let's see where it is. Yeah, I think I can, something is happening. No, I can just see, can see people only. Um, or so um, okay, at the bottom you can see the hover and then you can see the like chat. Mm -hmm. 
share screen where you got the ch share screen it, next to it should be chat mm -hmm. no okay. I'm trying to open it now if not i'll just read it for you no i saw the chat before then it's gone somewhere i just can't say i can see only the people but okay no problem i'll read them for you okay yeah okay maybe it will appear in a bit i'll be able to see Okay, yeah. uh, so uh, Nilufar says, personally for me, research is answering research questions systematically and analyzing mm -hmm. them. Um, Sara says, it's analyzing deeply assumptions which somebody put forward with experiment or survey. Um, Manojad says, identify any problems and work on them, doing experiments and solve them at the end. Okay. Kamola Research is doing some scientific work which requires doing analysis. Halima reviewing all opinions on the topic of the research. Um, Zarina qualitative and quantitative research. Okay. Um, 948385 <laughs> research is filling the gap in existing knowledge and creating new knowledge. Hmm, that's that's an interesting one. Okay. Um, research for me is Mukaddas says research for me is to raise the problem to find the experts' ideas about this problem and find the solution to this. Mm -hmm. Iroda says I think research is a real harvest or of person which has hard work for a long time. Lena says it is asking specific questions and trying to answer using empirical data. Uh, Kamola says, I did research uh, when I was in ILT for my diploma work. Uh, Gulich says, research is really demanding, challenging, long time, hard study. Guli says, careful and detailed study in a specific pro into a specific problem. Malika says, research is firstly comparison of works that had been done before by other scientists. Uh, Fatima says qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, Jalal Din says don't worry about that, you are the best for us. I don't know what it means. Rana says identifying specific problems, studying more to tackle it. Hilola says trying to find the problem in the field and resolve it. Okay, okay. It's quite a few very interesting definitions from what I've heard so far. And I think you know more about research than I do, to be honest. So you mentioned everything, which uh, I will, most of the things which I was going to talk about today and which are relevant to um, research in language education. Okay, um, so these are some of the, your understandings of research or the key characteristics of research. So I, I, from what uh, Snadira you've read, I know that some people have uh, done research in the past, Kamola, for example. Uh, did research. Yeah, um, Kamola, is Kamola there? Yes, yes, yes. I'm here with Diana. Yeah, yeah. What, was, uh, what was your research about? Was it related to TESOL, to language teaching? Um, no, mine was, uh, when I was in ILT, we did dip for diploma work, it was about using uh, L1, it means mother, yes, mother tongue, uh, in, during the EFL classes. Okay. And we did research, we, uh, like, uh, structured questions, then we did some teaching practices in order to answer the questions. Okay. And yeah. we also, uh, did some, um, interview, uh, with teachers. For example, some of the teachers who use L1 during the classes, in which cases do they use? And then uh, I still remember that how we did this research. We analyzed everything, each part of this uh, research. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you remember the analysis component? Yeah. Analysis. yeah, I remember. Okay, thank you, Kamola. I would really like to hear everyone's experience, but unfortunately we don't have time for that. Um, so I assume that if you, are, if you have never done research or if you haven't recently done research, you, are pro you probably still read about research. Do you, do you read research? Do you read some papers, journal articles or professional articles? 
uh, where teachers or other um, educators, professionals are talking about their own empirical studies. I assume you do, right? So if you don't, or if you don't think that you read enough, please um, do read and think about it more. And if um, you remember uh, this paper, some of the ideas from Simon Borg's paper, which um, I'm sure you've read for today, Simon Borg proposed that we need to stimulate teachers' interest in research and encourage uh, teachers to be engaged in research. And one way of doing it is uh, to help them to start thinking about research. That's why actually I wanted to begin with this activity to ask you to stimulate your understanding and your thinking about what research is in general, and just to, um, um, to, to let you start thinking about it more. Okay, uh, let us move on then to some definitions of research. And um, can I share the new screen with everyone? So do I just do new share then? No, 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 we can see the slide, you mean? Definitions yeah, of research? Yes, yeah, we can, can see. see definitions of research as the next yes. slide. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's great then. Um, so, as for the definitions, there are a number of definitions of research and uh, just selected, I just selected a few um, representatives one, representative definitions, which I thought might be particularly relevant. So one of the definitions suggested by Newton was research is a process of inquiry, which consists of three elements or three components, a research question or a problem, or we could talk about hypothesis here, the data which we collect or generate in the process of research. And the third very important component, which many of you mentioned in your comments, is the analysis. And of course, um, analysis should be followed by interpretation and discussion of the data. So these are the three essential components, core components of, um, of empirical research. A research question or problem, data, and analysis and interpretation of, um, of the data. Um, the other definition, which was suggested by a different scholar, uh, Michael Wallace, and uh, I think that some of you might be familiar with uh, Michael Wallace's uh, book, Action Research for Language Teachers. If uh, you haven't read this book or are not familiar with it, please, um, please have a look at it, or I think you can, you can find it if you Google for it, and you can probably download it or read some sections, at least some parts of this book. Um, a very practical book, and at the same time includes a lot of useful theory. So one of the uh, definitions as proposed by Michael Wallace was the research is a process of data collection, setting up of a database, and also the subsequent analysis of the data that you collect. Uh, that's what we call research in his understanding. And um, according to uh, Wallace's definition, research is a special type of inquiry or a special type of, um, um, of investigation. Not all inquiries based on data collection, but research, and especially research in language education, often involves collecting some sort of data and analyzing that data. So you can see some overlap here with Newton's definition and uh, Wallace's definition of, of research. There are plenty of other definitions which we're not going to cover uh, now, but I wanted to move on to some key characteristics um, of research, which you can see on the next slide. I've mentioned this term before, empirical. When we talk about empirical, we usually mean something that is based on our experience rather than just on theory. Because research involves not just doing a literature review, not just familiarizing yourself with the previous research, but also um, talking about what you have actually done. Of course, it involves some prior reading and um, uh, becoming familiar with existing theories and existing research, but also it involves doing your own investigation, doing your own research. And we'll talk about different types of research in a minute. That's what empirical means, based on your experience. Um, the other two very important characteristics of research are validity and reliability. You might have heard of this um, quite often. So when we talk about validity in research, it's the extent to which the research tools that we use, the instruments that we use, to what extent they actually uh, measure what it is supposed to measure like the, um, to what extent these me the instruments which, which are used are appropriate for the measurement, uh, for, for what we intend to test in our, in our study. The reliability, the other important characteristics, let's call it, of the research is the extent to which a particular tool that we use or a particular uh, technique or method that we use will produce the same results, no matter whenever we use it, however or by whoever it carries it out. For example, if we're doing the same, using the same technique, different people are trying it out. 
um, at different times. So whether it generates the particular technique, which, uh, technique will produce consistent result. So reliability is very important characteristics. There are a few other um, essential characteristics of research. I didn't write the definitions here, but I just thought I would briefly explain them to you. Uh, planned, that the research should be planned. You should follow um, some clear, you should have a clear um, idea in mind what you are planning to investigate. You should have a clear topic which you are going to focus on. You should have clear aim or aims um, and uh, develop a rationale and kind of a plan for, for your research project. It should be systematic, like step by step, which should be completed uh, following those particular steps. And uh, it's important not to miss out or not to omit any of these essential steps when you're doing a research project. We can talk about them in a bit as well. And uh, the other characteristics made public. When, what, what I mean by made public is something that you are willing to share or that can be shared upon completion. So when you complete your research project, um, you can share or you can make it public by publishing journal articles, publishing papers, publishing articles in professional magazines um, about your research, about the findings of your study. So writing up the findings of your research, but not only uh, share making it public in a written form, but also you can share it by presenting, for example, at uh, local and international conferences or doing some workshops or doing webinars, for example, where you would share uh, your research experience with the public. Uh, who might be interested to know or who might be doing something similar. So that's another important characteristics of, um, of research. Okay. Um, are there any questions so far? Just wanted to pause here for a bit before we move on to the levels of, of research or components of research. Okay. If you have any questions, um, I still can't see the comments box, but problem is uh, Nadira will make me aware of that. The comments yes. might pop out. Okay, yes. so let's move on then. Yes. So the next, um, let's move on to the next slide, levels of research, research traditions, or as they are often called, research paradigms, research approaches, and research methods. Some people are um, a bit confused when they hear these terms, three terms for the first time. And with our MA students, I'm teaching, by the way, I forgot to mention this research methods course to our MA students at the School of Education. Uh, when um, I talk to them about these three concepts um, in our first session, they're a bit confused. And I think that they, they think that they mean one and the same thing, but actually uh, different. So what we mean by research traditions or research paradigms, you can see um, the definition or the explanation by Campbell and colleagues on the next slide. Um, it is important that you recognize the tradition you are perhaps unknowingly accepting as each has various methodological advantages and disadvantages which feed through to your findings and conclusions. So when we um, talk about research traditions or paradigm, we are usually concerned with some key principles with the essential fundamental components that our research is based on the key uh, fundamental principles. And um, the scholars, Hitchcock and Hughes, in, in their paper published in 1995, they talk about two, they compare um, or associate research traditions, research paradigms with petroleum engineers and explorers. So I would like to ask you to take just a few minutes and think about the difference between these two types of researchers or scholars, petroleum engineers and explorers. And why do you think Hitchcock and Hughes associate uh, researchers with, with these two types of two groups of people, petroleum engineers and explorers? And um, um, if you could think about the difference between researcher who is like a petroleum engineer and researcher who is an explorer, if you could type in the box, you don't have to write a lot, maybe just one sentence or, or a phrase. What do you think, um, what is the difference between these two? Who is a petroleum engineer, more like a petroleum, and why? And who is more like an explorer? What type of researcher? Just give you a few minutes. No answers yet. 
-hmm. If there are no. any, if anyone would no. like to speak up, please, if you want to say something, that's fine. You don't have to write the comments. If someone would okay. like to volunteer and to share. Okay, thought. so we have Hilola saying, I think Explorer researcher is not afraid of, I don't know, of negative ending. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so Tohir says the first one is a mechanic and the second one is a driver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's another metaphor. Okay, another <laughs> yes. Metaphors actually that exist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, petroleum engineers are those who get the data from ready source, like the oil from the earth. Sabohan mm -hmm. says. Okay, uh, that's. Mm -hmm. Petroleum engineers might have specific aim. Explorers might not. Mm -hmm. so somebody says yes. that. And Sabohat says explorers are those who really search for the data. And Shahadat says petroleum engineer is giver, discipline to researcher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Just waiting if there's anything else to add, but I found, I've listened uh, to what you were saying and there are quite a few really good ideas, the ideas which, um, which I like. Somebody mentioned that um, petroleum engineers know what they're looking for and explorers do not know what they're looking for. Somebody mm -hmm. said that, or maybe I'm paraphrasing it a bit, but I've heard this. Um, yes, this yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And we have one more, Rano says, one who is practically using another is searching the sources maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there. That's it. Yeah, you can move on. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, thank you for sharing your ideas. Actually, there are different views, and different scholars have proposed um, different metaphors. But this one, which particular, which I particularly liked, and we share this with our students and discuss it a lot. So um, the this classification or subdivision of researchers into petroleum engineers and uh, explorers was first proposed by uh, not by Hitchcock and Hughes, they were talking about this as well, but first it was proposed by Spradley in 1980 when uh, the scholar introduced these two predominant traditions. And uh, the debates are very important and uh, they shouldn't be ignored, especially by teacher researchers. So they, if, you, if you think about it, it sounds a bit philosophical, but actually it's very interesting to, uh, to explore this further. And um, what is important is that in social sciences and in teacher education in particular, when we talk about petroleum engineers, why we're associated with petroleum engineers. As somebody mentioned, uh, petroleum engineers, they know what they are looking for. They have, for example, some clear maps, they have some specific goals. They know, for instance, they are looking, they have specific aims or goals in mind um, to, to look for gas or to look for oil. And they know that it's buried um, below the surface. And even before they begin looking for, for oil or gas, before they start their investigation, they, uh, they know what they're looking for and uh, they know that it's somewhere there. Um, they have clear aim, they have clear research, kind of, if we're associated now with the research tradition, it's similar to the researchers who have clear aim for their study, they have clear research questions or ideas, they know what, uh, what they want to find. And uh, very often when we talk about petroleum engineers um, type of researchers or research, um, research tradition, we, um, we call them um, positivists, positivist scholars. This is another name which is, which is used in research. While with explorers, we, we call them interpretivists. So I'll explain in a minute why we call them, uh, why we call the other group of researchers, the explorers. Is he explorer? Someone who is trying to look for something, like wandering in the wild. Usually explorers, they don't know exactly what they're looking for. And um, it's, their aim is very much different from the aim of petroleum engineers. So their goal is more, rather than to find something specific, to describe what they find. They're looking for something. They don't know exactly what they expect to find. They don't have a clear hypothesis. But um, they want to get a clear to, to provide to be able to provide a clear description of what they find. So they begin with a bit more general problem and they start gathering um, information. They move in different directions. They start in one direction, then they might change their route on the way. They might move on to a different direction in the middle. For example, they might take a turn. They might like explorers. They might see, for example, that the compass is guiding them in slightly different. They check the angle of the sun, for example. They make notes about different landmarks that they might find, and so on. So they note their observations. 
um, and uh, change might change their route quite frequently. So the same with explorer researchers. So that's the uh, that's the difference. And where very often we associate um, petroleum engineers with uh, do you think quantitative or qualitative scholars? Petroleum engineers. Any thoughts? So with petroleum engineers, you've mentioned some of you mentioned um, quantitative and qualitative research before. So with when we talk about petroleum engineers, very often we associate them with the quantitative scholars. So who deal with statistics, who deal with numbers, who look at uh, at large amounts of data, like large amount of data, who are looking for or exploring the views of um, and a large number of people, like hundreds of people sometimes, and doing some quantitative research. While explorers, they study more in-depth, they do very thorough in-depth investigation of views, beliefs of an individual or of small group of individuals. So explorers, they are more like a qualitative type of researchers or interpretivist researchers, as we call them. So I've prepared two short excerpts. I don't know how much time we have for this, but there are very short excerpts from two empirical studies. Um, and I would like to show them on the next slide. I just want you to ask, to ask you to have a look and see which of these researchers are explorers and which look more like petroleum engineers and uh, why you can just think about this a bit. Can everyone see this slide now? I don't know if... If this yes, can, yes, we can see yes, that. Yes. By Nguyen and Boers, 2018. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right, but anyway, so this is a short abstract, abstract from, um, from the paper by these two scholars. You have a look at it and just see what you think. Petroleum engineer, research or research tradition. Okay, yeah, everyone agrees that these scholars are more like petroleum or they, f they follow the petroleum engineer, engineering tradition, let's call it, of research rather than explorers. Okay, yeah, and you can see here, so is it more like a quantitative or a qualitative type of research? You might argue here, you might say that the number is not huge, it's not large enough to do quantitative research on 32 people, for example, in a group. So you might, it might seem to you that it's not sufficient for a quantitative research. And I would agree with you here. That's probably one of the limitations of the study. It would be good to have more participants, at least 50 or more. Um, but yeah, this is a quantitative research because they are looking at, yeah, investigating the benefits of vocabulary acquisition and they are, what are they doing here? They have two groups. They have comparison group. They have to, they're doing the pretest and they're doing the post test. They're doing the delayed post test, and uh, I haven't got the information on how they've analyzed the data, but they were using the um, some statistical analysis for it. How about this one? If you look at uh, Naske's research, So it is explorer research tradition type, and I think it is qualitative, even it took three years, or because we can see just interviews yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Semi-structured interviews, very well spotted. Yes, it says it took approximately three years. And actually that's the, one of the important, let's say important characteristics or features of qualitative research that very often, not always, you do it over time. And uh, for example, here they were, this research was a qualitative case study research was happening over three years. They were doing an in-depth investigation into participants' attitudes, language attitudes. So uh, this is definitely a qualitative research. And this scholar is an explorer. Yeah. And uh, how many participants did he involve in the study? How many subjects or participants? One. We don't know the exact number. One. Yeah, it says here traces one Chinese. Oh, one student. Chinese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One student. Yes. So, and very often, might be surprising for some of you, but very often with quanti with qualitative research, we have very small number of um, 
participants or research subjects just one or maybe only a few like a couple or up to five when you're doing um, interviews wouldn't recommend um, doing a qualitative interview with more than maybe five or six people you could do it with ten or more but it will be very very time consuming uh, to to collect the data to transcribe the data and it will be difficult to do an in-depth investigation so this is definitely as a qualitative type of research okay let us move on then and just a tiny comment, yeah, from yeah, yeah. Like saying, yeah, this is a good example of case study, right? So this mm -hmm. is, and it says here, case study approach, right? So when yes. you study like one, but you go deeper, right? Deep investigation, like into mm -hmm. the yeah. or feelings of one participant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, case study, though, it can be with two or three people, but usually one person, very often one person. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's actually, I wanted to talk about case study. I'll mention it very briefly on the next slide. So when we talk about research approaches, so what's the difference uh, between research paradigms and research approaches? Um, there are more than four research approaches, but I wanted today to talk about these four, naturalistic research, survey research approach, case study, and action research. So um, let's start with naturalistic research approach, which is often used in psychology. It's also used by social scientists, it's used by, uh, by teachers as well, by language teachers. It in, very often naturalistic research approach involves the use of methods like observation. So you are observing participants or your subjects in natural setting. You are observing it in natural environment and there is as little intervention involvement on the part of researcher as possible. So you are, um, if you are doing it with your, with your students, if you are observing a group of students, for example, and looking for certain aspects of their behavior in the classroom, maybe you could also explore uh, teacher-student interaction or student-student interaction in the classroom, the classroom management, the dynamics. Um, you might use this naturalistic research approach. Which, and the method which we use within this approach uh, very often is participant observation. So you might be using, observing um, your, your students using this approach. You might be argue, arguing that there are some disadvantages and advantages of this approach. Yeah, there are some disadvantages, but I think um, this is a very good way, non-interventional way, kind of when you uh, reduce the intervention on the part of yourself as a researcher and uh, there is less pressure kind of on the psychological pressure on people who are being observed and on the teachers. Um, though, of course, the disadvantage is that like with any other observation, being present in the classroom might still affect the behavior and the involvement on the part of the learners. This is the naturalistic research approach. Uh, there is also the survey approach, which is used kind of this research approach can be defined as the um, very often we use questionnaires as a method to collect data with the help of survey approach. Collection of information from individuals by asking them to respond to a set of questions. That's the definition of survey. And um, um, I'm sure that some of you have, been, have used survey in the past. I use survey in my, um, in my postdoctoral project. And I think that some of you might have participated in the survey which I conducted with uh, Uzbek teachers of academic writing and teachers of general writing, reading and writing. Uh, over 100 teachers took part um, in our survey on academic reading and writing difficulties. Uh, when, and then um, after having analyzed the results of this survey, we were able to develop this website and also the teacher training uh, set of materials for, uh, for our teachers. So yeah, survey research approach uses mainly quantitative strategies like questionnaires with numerical items, though not always there are closed-ended questions used in questionnaire. Questionnaire might include some open-ended questions. And then you might say, but this involves, this is a qualitative research strategy. Yes, this is true. So survey research approach might be using qualitative research strategy as well, which involves open-ended questions, which can't be analyzed statistically or quantitatively. You will have to analyze it qualitatively. But uh, sometimes it uses both strategies, which is a mixed, so-called mixed methods approach. Um, in Simon Borg's paper, which we're reading, you've noticed that he used survey research approach, but he also was using interviews. He selected a few representative participants from the survey respondents, and he involved them in uh, an interview, semi-structured interview. So he used both strategies. Um, qualitative and quantitative followed by, uh, by quant qualitative 
which is called mixed methods approach. I don't know if you are familiar with the term mixed methods. Yeah, in my PhD, I've also used mixed methods. So I've combined the analysis of the quantitative data, student essays with um, interviews. So that's why we call it survey approach, because you are using it, exploring human behaviors by using surveys, uh, by using questionnaires and uh, spreading it to a large number of people usually. The next one is case study approach, case study research, which Ms. Nadira has already mentioned, and just only a couple of things to add here. So it's an in-depth investigation of a particular research problem. And uh, using this approach, we usually explore one or a very, very small number of cases over time. Very often it's happening over a prolonged period of time. And it involves a number, um, or might involve multiple sources of information. Like it might involve different techniques or methods, like observations, interviews. It might be some material which you analyze, the recorded material. It might be analysis of documents, for example, analysis of student essays or analysis of textbooks or teachers' reports and so on. So it's a combination of different um, methods can be used in a case study approach. Okay, that's uh, this one. And also the action research. How many of you have done action research? Would anyone like to speak up and say whether you've done, I'm sure that some of you have done classroom, so-called classroom research, action, action research. When you are investigating um, into your own practice, looking at a particular problem, something that you would like to change, and then this interesting problem that you have, you are changing it into a research question gradually. And why we call it action research, because then as a teacher, you're, as a practitioner, you develop some actions or a set of actions to try out solving this problem or addressing this question. So we develop a set of actions and then you interpret the consequences of this action and analyze it. And very often you might publish the, uh, the outcome of your action research in good journals, in professional journals or in professional magazines. Okay, are any, is, there, is there anyone who ever done action, action research? No? Okay. Um, yes, Hilola says, yes, I did. And then Mukadda is saying, I'm doing action research on how multimedia works in primary classes. Okay, very interesting. Tahir and uh, Gina Sirva says, yes, they've done mm -hmm. that. Okay, so you might want to read a bit more about what action research involves. I just mentioned it only very briefly here, but um, in this book, which I was uh, talking about earlier, Michael Wallace's book, he talks about action research as well. So please um, have a look at the relevant chapters of this book and you might find something very interesting there. Okay, um, these are the key research approaches which I wanted to talk about today. Um, as for task four, I don't think we'll spend much time on it, but just wanted to ask you, uh, those of you who read Simon Borg's paper on teachers' conceptions of research, so you probably identified which research tradition their work is uh, located in, what research paradigm or research tradition they worked in, in their study. Was it more an um, interpretivist or positivist? I mean, more of a ex petroleum engineer or explorer? tradition. Would anyone like to say Simon Borg's? I think it is explorer mm. or research or approach. I mean Simon Borg used it and research methods he used or called data analysis kind of surveys he uses interviews or if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So I think it is explorer. Explorer. Research. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else like to say anything else? Do you think he used purely qualitative method or methodology in, in, the, in his study? Okay, any other thoughts? Well, he did use quantitative way of calculating this data, but yeah. still I think it is qualitative um, research type, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, um, yeah, so you might have some other, some other thoughts on it, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that he used a combination. So he started with quantitative, right? So he collected survey responses from over 100, 150 people, right? If I'm not, I don't remember exactly, but it was all 155 responses from, from teachers. 
And uh, then he did some qualitative research as well. Absolutely, I agree with what you said. He invited some people to some of the teachers to take part in um, a qualitative part of it where he interviewed the teachers. So I would say here it's not purely qualitative, it's a combination and it's a mixed methods that he was using. So he supplemented quantitative with qualitative and did further in-depth exploration of it. So I think it's both. And um, as far as I remember, it's mentioned somewhere in the paper that he, he uses both, combination of both. And I wouldn't say that he's purely explorer, explorer um, and petroleum engineer at the same time. So he used both approaches, both uh, paradigms, sorry. As for the approach, um, which approach did he take more? Did he take more, um, did he take any of these approaches which we've talked about, naturalistic research, survey, case study, or action? Survey? Survey, yes. yes. Survey. He used survey, mm -hmm. interviewed. Yep. Yeah, but he was, uh, his main bulk of uh, data which he collected was from the survey which he spread out to a large number of teachers. So as it's mentioned in the paper, he used more of a survey approach and then he did a further in-depth exploration of individual cases of teachers. So he supplemented it with kind of further analysis. He didn't do naturalistic observation. I don't think he was engaged in that at all in the study, but the survey approach supplemented with uh, some further qualitative analysis of um, interview data. What methods he used in the study? We didn't talk in detail about methods today, but I was mentioning it as I was going through traditions and approaches. By methods, we mean all these strategies or techniques which we use to, to collect and to analyze the data. For example, one of the methods is the use of open-ended or closed-ended questionnaires or semi-structured interviews or, or participant observations or we could say for example the use of uh, learning logs or diaries student diaries when you look at their uh, analyze their feelings and their perceptions in the diaries which they complete over time for instance so there might be uh, these are some of the methods or analysis of the scripts analysis of the of some materials like written materials or audio visual materials so these are all the research methods the specific strategies that you take to analyze your data qualitative or quantitative data in your study okay has anyone got any questions um, so far we didn't get to talking a lot about questions in planning but maybe this is something which we can talk about at some point in the future but just wanted to highlight how we start, what we need to begin with when we start doing research. So um, I think that's very important to begin with a clear idea about what you want to do a research on, about your topic. And the ideas for your topic might come from various sources. The first source where it can come from is of course from your own experience. How can you come up with your research idea, with your research project? From your own learning and teaching experience. That's how I came up with my research idea because I was learning and I was teaching academic writing in Uzbekistan uh, to, my, to my students. And uh, then I decided to, um, to continue exploring it further in the EAP context. And in the UK, I still chose academic writing as my focus, focus of my further research, and I'm still continuing with it. So my research focus came from my personal experience, first as a learner, then as a teacher. Your ideas for research can definitely come from reading. And that's what we recommend to our students, that they should read as widely as possible about the topic. They should be familiar with the research topic, with the area of the research, and uh, learn more about it um, through reading, by reading about other studies, relevant studies. And of course, it can also um, come from um, the, comp the context like your, sorry, your interest, your motivation. So what you are very much interested to learn about, what you are motivated to learn about in your particular context that you're working in, for example. So this is a bit linked with the first point which I mentioned to your experience, your experience and your interest. Uh, there are a few other questions in planning research as you can see on the slide. So one of the, after you choose your topic, you would need to think about what you want to address in your study, what would be the questions that your research will address, what approach you will use, and we've talked today about some of the approaches. 
you would also need to start planning your data generation or your data collection. How will you collect your data? So what steps will you take in collection or in your data collection? Where will you, what, what is the context that you will conduct your research in? In which particular context? Who will be your participants? I would prefer to use the word participants rather than subjects. You can say subjects, but who are the participants of your study? Um, you would also need to think about ethics. And ethics is a big issue here in the UK. It's a very important uh, component of doing research. It's probably important everywhere, but in the UK they put um, so much em emphasis on it. And I think if I um, talk about ethics in one of the uh, future webinars, uh, I think this would be a very important thing to address as well and to talk about ethical principles. So what ethical principles will guide your research? How will you analyze your data? You would need to think about not just methods of data collection, but methods of data analysis. What methods you will use? How will you then communicate the findings across to the bigger audience? How will you share your findings with other teachers, with other researchers? How will you publish your, the findings of your study? Where you're planning to publish it? What will you do? Where will you share it by presenting at um, conferences and seminars? What will the research contribute to society? You will also need to think about what contribution you will make with your research to the, to the society. Okay, so these are just some of the key questions in planning research, which I think um, which are important to address. And um, I would like also to highlight that you would need to think about research not as something linear, not as something is going in one direction and never going backwards. It's more like a cyclical or iterative process when you are moving from one to another, to another step, and then you might go backwards. For example, once you've started um, collecting, but so first sorry, reading about the previous research, and then you start uh, being more specific and more clear about the design of your own study, you might again need to go backwards and read a bit more, find more relevant sources, then modify your research questions. So there is a lot going on here, and it's more like a cyclical and iterative process rather than the one-way um, straight, one-way linear process when you do the research. I don't think, uh, I'd better not start talking about research questions now because I think it will be, uh, it will be too much and uh, we can probably have a separate session for it if people are interested. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Um, I think we're going, oh, I mean, some people might, might have other plans, so I just don't want to keep anyone. Yes, thank you. That was really useful. We have several questions mm -hmm. and uh, if we take like maybe 10, 15 minutes to answer yeah, the yeah. questions. Okay. So we'll start from the last one. So what computer programs is helpful to analyze data? Okay. Yeah, it depends on what kind of data you are analyzing. Um, for example, I would say that I, in my research, I was using the program which is called Cometrics a lot. I don't know if you are familiar. I'm going to send the link now. Let me just um, send comatrix.com is the system, especially if you are doing, I don't know where to, how to post it in the, because my, my box is still not open. Um, I'll, I'll post it, yes, comatrix.com. It's uh, C-O-H. Yes. Comatrix. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, let me mm -hmm. just open it up again yeah yeah the core metrics is one of the programs which i've used there is also the other program especially if you are interested in analyzing language for example syntactic lexical diversity syntactic complexity of students um writing i'm, not, I'm talking about writing more so then you are using you could be using the program which is called synlex as uh, like syntax uh, the spelling s-y-n synlex syntactic and lexical it's is called it Syntactic Complexity one? Analyzer. Is it the first one? Yeah. Okay. Syntactic mm -hmm. Complexity Analyzer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's also when you, when you uh, click on that link, uh, of when you find it on you Google, you Google for it and it comes up immediately, it also gives the link to Lexical Complexity Analyzer. So it's a different kind of program, but developed by the same scholar, Professor Lu at Pennsylvania University. 
um, he developed the program called Lexical Complexity Analyzer. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, yeah, so this is the these are the ones which uh, I used. Um, there are also, you think about what exactly what what is useful for qualitative. That's more for quantitative type of analysis, um, which which you could use for qualitative. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about software, but qualitative. Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure about the software which you can use, but there are some programs which can help you to uh, to code the data. So let me just see. Not to analyze it probably, but can help you a little bit with uh, with coding of um, of the data. And I can send you there are a few of these. Is it possible if I say Atlas TI, for example? I don't know if you are familiar with it. It's called Atlas TI A T L A S dot mm -hmm. T I. That's a software. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and Vivo is another one, which is also very helpful for qualitative. Uh, N with capital, then V with capital. I, I, V, O, and Vi, or Vivo, and Vivo. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you are all familiar with SPSS, or you might have heard of SPSS. That's for statistical, again, analysis of the data. Very much, very useful for statistical analysis of, um, of the data. SPSS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are a few others, and uh, I might send them maybe just below that on the on Facebook below that uh, link about today's webinar. I might send some more if it's okay. Maybe some more ideas. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. For quantitative okay. and qualitative as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. There was um, empirical analysis methods are mandatory for research articles, paper. What book would you recommend to, so to learn more about empirical methods? What is it? Empirical research. Oh, empirical yes. research. Oh, yeah. yeah, there are a few sources. I don't know whether they're all available. Uh, for example, I can access them through our library. I don't know if they're all available online to access. But um, there are some books by, for example, by Cresswell on research. Um, let me just find the exact title of the book by Richard. Sorry, let me just find it. Cresswell Research Methods um, book, Research Methods Design. Uh, he mainly talked about qualitative, but he talked about quantitative as well. It's called um, Research Design. The book is called Research Research design, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods approaches by John Cresswell. Research design, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods approaches. That's the title of the book. Um, there is also a very useful book which I would like to definitely recommend is by Dornay, um, Zoltan Dornay. He did a lot on, on motivation, that's his main area, but he also uh, published on research. And there is another book by Dornay, just give you the title of the book, Research Methods in Applied Linguistics. That's the name of uh, Dornay's book. Again, he talked about both qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods methodologies. It's not very recent one published in 2007, but it's a very useful one and which scholars here continue using a lot. Research methods in applied linguistics. I also have some uh, articles and like journal articles related to research and some other books, some more, some of the older books, which I know about research, but again, I can probably put them on Facebook in the link. There are quite a few. Diana, Diana we can see your email. Can you just close it? Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Ethical issues. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nilfar says research in applied linguistics by Perry. You know by that? Perry. Terry. Yes. 
I don't know. Uh, I haven't used it. Yeah, I've heard of the name. I haven't used it myself, to be honest, so I wouldn't say anything. Yeah, but I think it's probably a good one as well to look at. Okay, are there any other urgent questions? Yes, some people started thanking you uh, for the webinar. It was really wonderful. It was very um, productive, yes. Um, says, uh, okay, how is it realistic for university teachers to do research in Uzbekistan? Do they require some guidance from the more experienced researchers? Yeah, I don't know how it works in, um, I'm out of the context for a while, for about 10 years, so, but is there a need now to have an experienced colleague or a mentor from, from abroad to do, to be able to do the research or, or can it be anyone? It doesn't have to be a, a scholar from abroad. I, I don't think I can give a, the exact answer, definite answer to this question. And I don't want to make a mistake here. Probably Kamola knows a bit more about this, maybe because she recently did her research in uh, Kamola Murat Kasimova in, in Uzbekistan. Research. Research. I think they, are, they mean like not the procedure, but just um, in general, whether it's possible for someone to do the research independently without anyone's support. Probably it is possible to do research and it's possible to publish the, like, for example, to do some action research or to do some survey research and then publish the results, try to publish the outcomes of your research in, uh, in some good journals. Or maybe you could collaborate with some other colleagues. Very often when you're starting to publish something, it's good to collaborate with other researchers, with more experienced colleagues, perhaps either in your home country or abroad who published in some journals and then work together with them on a project and then publish together for the first time just to get some experience to learn how to do it. But I think it's definitely possible to try to do it on your own. Okay, so people are asking your email um, if it's possible we'll, to contact you. Uh, will send my email, <laughs> yeah, I will send it to everyone. Probably I'll put it there as well, mm -hmm. my university email. Mm -hmm. Okay, so saying as you mentioned, publishing is not easy. In with journals, it's it's easier to publish for the first time. Um, for example, if you are aiming for peer-reviewed journals with high impact factor or uh, more or less high moderately high impact factor, perhaps um, system. Still, it's not very very easy, but it's probably easier than, for example, TESOL Quarterly or Applied Linguistics. System, it's like spelled like system, S-Y-S-T-E-M. This is one of the journals. It's not only for, uh, specifically for English language teachers, it's for um, other languages as well, not only English, but I think you can try pub to publish there. You can also um, probably ELT journal, it's a bit more difficult, but you can perhaps try English language teaching journal. Um, or, for example, uh, Journal of Academic Writing. I'm all talking about writing as well here because it's my main area. Journal of Academic Writing. I've recently uh, submitted a paper there. It got major revision, revisions and we're with my co-author working on major revisions and aiming to resubmit there. But yeah, uh, Journal of Academic Writing. Probably um, Language Learning is another one. It's, it has high impact factor and it's a bit getting a bit harder. Or studies in second language acquisition, good journal as well to try, especially if you're doing some quantitative research or mixed methods. Okay, yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. And there are a few others and there are some professional magazines uh, if you're probably a starting um, researcher and you would like to try and publish something in a, a professional magazine, there are some professional magazines which, um, which you could like English teaching professional, for example, so where you could publish um, in. Again, I can send you some the names of some journals of both research and professional, which if you want to, to try. Diana, thank you very much. I see so young, talented young people here. And I graduated the same university, called all many, many years before I'm 77, 
but I would like to hear some ideas about the Sedwin's technology as tutoring, because here in Uzbekistan, it is not so easy to find a good tutor. All tutors are living abroad, Sabira, Diana, Ulubek. Maybe you think about Sedwin's tutoring uh, style of tutoring. One tutor in Uzbekistan and you from abroad can organize a good, so to say, a team of people who prepare a really competitive uh, specialist in Uzbekistan. Because I see that in Uzbekistan nowadays, it's not possible to get so kind of research as Diana did uh, with our local tutors. I know the proper I speak. I am focusing on case study, but in business English, maybe I will write a letter to you. Thank you very much for your very much of webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's, I, I don't know, to be honest, how it works, but probably it's possible to, um, to organize and to get some support from, we call them mentors here, like people who give some guidance with research and um, who, who can collaborate with researchers in different country and uh, give them some advice, maybe um, help them, give them some feedback on, on their ideas or on the drafts of their writing and so on. So maybe it's possible to organize some collaboration of this kind. Yes, and yeah, hopefully, yes. So that was one of the ideas that we were discussing actually before mm -hmm. quarantine with Diana and Ulugbek and Yelena Volkova and others were planning to organize courses, right? Hopefully <laughs> um, on, on different topics. And uh, one of them would be, uh, for example, on research. Yes, so that's something that um, in the pipeline. So we didn't have much time with this quarantine and with other um, commitments that we all have, right? So we'll think about it, right, in the summer. So hopefully we, we might, um, yes. Start Suddenly, some. by the time we finished, nearly, so I have the chat, um, the messages appeared now. When I stop yeah, because sharing, yeah, you stop sharing, then you can so see. It. Yes, can <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Yeah, I'll right. know now. I'll learn from it. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, is there I also wanted to ask you at the end if you would like to just maybe to send me um, on Facebook or to send me some and uh, send me an email once I share my email with you, whether you would like to listen to some other topics related to research or it could be not related to research. If it's something related to research, what specifically you would like to learn? Maybe in the future we can organize mm -hmm. some other webinar mm -hmm. because yeah, we have, yeah. for example, in our research methods courses, it's like eight week course where this is one of the sessions which like, and it's not even full session, part of it, which I was talking about today. It's, we have it for two hour session. Um, I am uh, elaborating what Diana, yeah. uh, do you have, do you have Telegram? Um, I haven't got yet, but I think I can open. Yes, could you please open so because we have the Telegram group, we have the Telegram group. So then um, I'll, yeah, I'll contact you and on that. Yes, yeah, so I can mm. add you to our group. So you can see the feedback. You can write your feedback in the Telegram group, guys, mm -hmm. so that we have everything there. And then, yes, and uh, so that Diana can, you can contact Diana directly, okay? I just sent my email yes. to yes. everyone. Yes, we saw that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we can call the day. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was really productive. I myself learned a lot. It was really very interactive and, um, I, I really liked how you presented the, this kind of heavy stuff in an easy yeah, way, right? <laughs> I prepared some more tasks and I wanted to do it in a more interactive way, but it takes a long time. No, sure. No, yeah, that was great. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, somebody asked about certificates. So as usual, you know, like we issue the certificates uh, um, in the Telegram group, join our Telegram group so that you can learn uh, the details of how to get it. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Miss Diana. It was really thank productive. You. Thank it you very, very much. Good. I thank was really you. glad thank to you. see you. I'm so glad to see you all here, to see so many familiar faces and to hear you all. Thank you, Diana. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. much. Online. Thank, thank you. Goodbye, everyone. For organizing such a wonderful webinar. Kiss your children from us.